So really warm welcome to everyone to this retreat and really hope it's going to be um, both a kind of rich and beneficial exploration and I also hope it's going to be a really enjoyable time and yeah, those two can actually go together. So, you know, as we kind of start off uh, the beginnings of a meditation retreat, there can be these kind of um, mixed feelings <laughs> that we can have, you know, oh my God, why, why have I done this again to myself? Or what am I about to go into? You know, what, or maybe like what terrors await me hidden inside of myself? But both um, meditation in general can be an enjoyable experience. Yeah, and I'll speak a little bit about what, what we might mean there. But this particular kind of exploration, the exploration of what we could call the unlimited qualities of the heart, the, the fully released qualities of the heart. Um, and I want to just mention already, you know, this, this word heart isn't meant to be in kind of a distinction to the mind you know it's not like the 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 mind isn't also going to become limitless and and expanded and something to remember from the very beginning if we use the word heart we mean the heart and mind yeah what we what we make this distinction uh, in various languages between the heart and the mind there isn't that distinction carried across in so much of the teachings some people even make a translation heart mind, you know, with a hyphen between them, or even like maybe not even that, just heart mind, <laughs> made into one word, mind heart. And that's what we're kind of speaking about. And we might lean more into mind at one point. We might lean into the language of heart at another point. But just get that sense: it's the whole, the whole of you, is being invited into this kind of exploration. So we want these practices to be easeful, we want them to be supportive, we want them to actually reach the parts of ourselves that really want to be reached. And so as we begin this retreat, just kind of reflect to yourself, if something could grow from this time, if something could be touched, if some quality could come into being, what would it be for you? What in your life, in your heart and mind, in your being, or what in the world would you like to see more of? What would you like to see grow, sprout, like a flower sprouting from the earth, getting stronger? And this is an important question because when we look into wisdom teachings at this word meditation, it doesn't mean to think about, and it doesn't mean to kind of coolly observe. It actually means to cultivate. Just as you cultivate, you know, the, the piece of land near to you. Maybe you pop some seeds in there once in a while, you water it, you give it sunshine, you give it compost. Why? Because you want something to grow that isn't already there. Meditation is the same thing. It's the skill, the art, the task of bringing things into being that aren't fully there yet. And actually that's what's happening in the heart, the mind, the being, consciousness, at any time. We're bringing things into being. But much of the time we're we're dictated by habits and conditionings. Could be the conditionings of our culture, of our time right now, how we see the world, what we value, you could say. Or the kind of tricks that we've learnt through our life to, to so say, to get by. Yeah. 
how I get by through that kind of a, a work day or an education day. Oh, and we start to bring that across to the meditation. Yeah? That, that beautiful quality, that ingenuity of your heart and mind might be thinking, so how do you get from one side to the other of a 45-minute meditation without it being too painful? And then this can become another thing to, to, to get good at getting through, surviving. And everything that we know, look at us, you know, what an incredible human species we are. Dressed, sitting in these chairs inside walls, looking at a TV screen. Wow, amazing. And we've survived through... <laughs> Billions of years. And these teachings are then offered to us, not to give up all of that, but to question what would really thrive here? What would really love to grow, to expand? What beauties? What releases? What peacefulnesses? What connections? What kindnesses? What compassions, what joys, what spaciousness wants to come into being. And so just taking some time today, maybe in this moment as I continue speaking, or maybe just to sit aside some moment and just really ask, what is it I want to see more of? Another way we could say is, what, what do I value? What do I value? Another question or way of phrasing that same question is, what brings meaningfulness to my life? Think about a time when life felt meaningful. What brings meaningfulness? What do I value? What do I want to see more of? And I expect in some ways it will align with the exploration of these, these teachings. So I want to mention a couple of theoretical, technical things about meditation practice. So you may be familiar with um, a few kinds of, of doing meditation. Um, and there's lots of overlap and there aren't really any clear distinctions in life that I can discover. <laughs> yeah. But there are ways of talking about things that help us to kind of understand what is it that I'm doing here. So one way of doing meditation practice, we might use a term samadhi or samatha, yeah, which is really about gathering more and more, yeah, becoming more and more present but we're specifically gathering actually into more and more well-being, a feeling of well-being. And this is where I just want to refer back to what I said earlier, that meditation can be enjoyable. Yeah? And it doesn't maybe necessarily seem that way when we're, when we're there doing it and it's become the task we have to do. But when we're distracted... Yeah, when we're pulled around by this and then that and you know we're getting agitated and all of that and we actually say you know what I don't have to do all of that I'm just going to be with this breath I'm just going to listen to these sounds I'm going to give myself a simple little task in that moment body heart and mind consciousness attention they're all together in the same moment yeah, we're not pulled apart, we're actually gathered together. And as we just do that and we gather and we're here, we're present, if you tune in, it's just a little bit nicer. It's just a little bit nicer. You're giving yourself the gift of presence. Ah. Now, there's another part to this. What really matters is how we breathe how we listen, how we give or how we pay that attention that really has that freeing quality about it. And of course it's subtle, which means it can be overlooked. 
we actually start to sense how it's actually releasing something. And that's what it means to be practicing in freedom teachings. We're releasing something when we gather together. That calming, the grounding, the easing that gets referred to as samatha in the Pali Sanskrit. All this kind of absorbing the goodness, gathering together, opening, releasing, and that's samadhi qualities. And that can be a whole way of practicing. It's a beautiful, beautiful way of practicing. Another way of practicing we call vipassana. Yeah, it's also known as insight practice. And what we mean by that is both when you notice something about your life that brings a sense of well-being, yeah, that's an insight. We also mean this insight as bringing that, that understanding into a way of looking at life a way of relating to life that actually brings more freedom. What we mean by that is usually it supports a letting in, it supports a letting be, it supports a letting go. Yeah, it supports some release in that. Yeah. Instead of resisting, trying to keep life away, we let it in. Yeah. Let it be here. Instead of grabbing on and trying to keep all the goodness for oneself, we let it go as well. Yeah, we're kind of countering those forces. So I'll give you an example is seeing inconstancy. Yeah, you see everything that you can have in this world, it's actually inconstant, it's actually already in flow. And when we really see that, we understand that, it's, oh yes, now I understand. All of that grabbing onto things that are like this, it, letting go, it makes sense. And then we can actually bring that across as an insightful way of looking. We just say, ah, this is inconstant. I may not see it, but I can know it is. And in that, the grip opens, the release occurs. Right? So that's a whole other way that we can practice. Right? Another way that we can practice freedom. And of course, the Nietzsche inconstancy lens is just it's just one way in a certain sense the brahma viharas that are the exploration of this retreat which are called something like the the godly abodes or the divine abiding uh, the divine homes the i don't know what what might be some other words for that yeah but I, that sense of really beautiful spiritual um, spaces that we can enter and remain in are uh, in a sense another another exploration and as I say they're not just heart qualities although we tend to kind of speak about it that way because there isn't that clear bright distinction yeah. So what we're doing here is exploring the ways in which the heart is touched or moved or opened in a specific way. Yeah. How the mind is touched, or moved, opened. So you kind of find for yourself actually how that language lands. Does it, does it make sense to have a distinction? Does it make sense not to have a distinction between the heart and the mind? Whatever, whatever feels helpful there. But whatever we sense about them, just knowing they're not only working in the heart. They're not only working in your heart. They're also actually for changing the world. And I'll speak a little bit more about this later on in, in this session and also later on in the retreat, how they actually change the world. The one way of looking at these practices is they actually work on the, the neural plasticity of the brain. Yeah. We're actually shaping how our brains function through encouraging them to travel along uh, more skillful routes. Yeah. So we can kind of transcend our 
selfishness, transcend our greediness, overcome our aversiveness, lessen our reactivity, lessen jealousy. These kind of qualities that actually really limit the maximum potential and we'll unpack these over the over the week. Yeah, it's not like we have to do everything all at once. Although, I must admit, it's kind of tempting. <laughs> but like, we'll go into these areas and get to know them, become familiar. Yeah. So, habitually, we have these kind of routes through which our thinking goes. And as you'll know, anything about a path, the more it's travelled, and the stronger, the clearer that path becomes. You can kind of imagine a woodland or, you know, uh, a field that's kind of growing rich with vibrant uh, crops or whatever else, and there's a path there. You know, there's probably one part of us, the anarchistic part of us, is I'm just going to walk wherever I like. And there's another part of us that just starts to follow the easier path. And I wonder if, like, thought patterns like us and also like the wind and the water, they tend to follow the easiest path. And so in Brahma Vihara practice, often what we're doing is actually strengthening pathways. And, you know, those who've done this practice will kind of know and notice the, the outcomes of that. If you really just practice with kindness, practice with kindness, you suddenly start to notice, oh, that, that option has become more available to bring kindness to a stranger, to bring kindness to a tree. They say, how does that even happen and work? So that's, I'm just speaking about one way in which we could envision how this is working. Yeah, strengthening or reshaping neural plasticity of the brain, how it works, what thoughts arise, those mysterious things, thoughts, where do they come from? What thought is going to come next? In a way, we're cultivating the soil, planting seeds of thoughts and intentions that are likelier to arise. This practice is also called verbal fabrication. So there will be many times on this retreat where we are sitting in spontaneous verbal fabrication. We are just sitting there thinking and these words are coming out and they're having a particular tone and they're very likely going to be critical about us or about someone else. You know, there'll be some story about what I can get, what I can get rid of, and if I only did that, this moment would be perfect. That kind of thinking is going to go on. What we can do in, in Brahma Vihara practice is replace a lot of that thinking with much more beneficial thought seeds, thought plants, that yeah. really has an impact on our ways of thinking, our ways of conceiving, our ways of perceiving, our ways of setting intentions, all of which become the fruits of our lives. Yeah. So it's kind of laying that out as kind of a, a framework of understanding these teachings. Now again, you know, there's no clear distinctions between the samatha, samadhi, calmness and gathering types of practices, the insight, understandings, vipassana way, sort of looking at life, deepening our understanding, penetrating through the layers of reality that we experience. And these Brahma Viharas, these beautiful, expansive, illimitable, boundless, qualities of the heart and the mind into beautiful ways of relating to life. So I just want to mention a a few things that I think kind of are helpful in the in the beginning to kind of put, put out there for us. It's really possible to imagine, to know that the expanded heart is a fruit of the practice. Yeah. If when we bring an insight into being, if when we bring some gathering, some calmness into being, if the heart doesn't also open, if there isn't some sense of something 
lovely or loving kind of coming through, maybe it's not fully ripened, that insight, that gathering. Yeah, and there's something there. We can tune into that and just check, ah, the fruit of this practice, is it touching something? Is something being touched? It doesn't have to be radical, yeah? It can just be something that we tune into. Yeah, and we're all different. We're all individual. There's no pressure for any particular kind of experience. But just noticing if that moves you in some way. It would be helpful to notice. So we could say the Brahma Viharas are part of the fruits of the practice. They could even be, for some of us, some of the time, the goal of the practice. Yeah. What our practice is for, what we want to see more of, what we're cultivating, what we're growing. But equally, they are a way of practicing. Yeah. They're a way of practicing. They're a way of relating to experience. And they're not only limited to um, formal practice ways of relating. Yeah, so in a formal practice of a Brahma Vihara, we might bring a being to mind. It might be a friend. And we might bring some phrases that kind of embody that feeling. So say we're going to cultivate metta, a feeling of friendliness. We're going to wish this being well in various ways. And we're going to strengthen that neural pathway through that modality. Bring a being to mind. Use some phrases to carry across that feeling. May you be well. May you be peaceful. May you be happy. But any moment, any moment we might pay attention to anything and choose to bring that quality. Could we have a sense of friendship to this body we're in? What would that mean to this sensation in the leg? Can there be a sense of welcoming it? Like you would welcome a friend. Whatever it's like. So there's always this way of relating. And what you'll notice as you do that, that boundary seems to kind of be blurring a little bit. This way of relating has insights in it has ways of looking that are insightful. Friendship feels nice. I'm going to bring friendship to this sensation. Ah, oh, that's releasing something. It's become an insightful way of looking. But check in, now it feels good. And I feel more gathered, feel more harmonized. Calming something. Constant overlap, these different aspects of experience kind of opening out through all of this. Why? Because there's always a way of looking, there's always a way of relating that's shaping what we experience. So the Brahma Viharas, they can be the fruit of the practice, they could be the goal of the practice for us. Yeah. And they're a way of practicing. And we'll be moving through this territory and at any moment you can just lean more into one side or the other. More into the gathering, the gathering, the harmonizing, the well-being. Breathing that, listening to that, listening through that. At times we'll bring an insight. Ah, what do I notice? How is this working? What's going on here? How can I bring that more into being? And at other times it's going to be about getting more of that and giving more of it away. Working through that neural pathway kind of modality. So let's get that strengthened. Let's give that away. This beautiful quality right here. May you have that. Nothing for me. Everything for everyone. But of course we still get loads through that. Yeah. Beneficial renunciation. Beneficial giving. So these practices are going to bring us gifts. Yeah? They might be small gifts, they might be immeasurably vast gifts. But that also means we need to bring our gifts to them. Yeah. Our steadiness, our presence, our sensitivity. And as always in these kinds of situations, yeah, the more we can give, the more we receive. Yeah, it's a reciprocal engagement. 
So in any moment, we're going to be needing our mindfulness. Yeah, we're going to need to become familiar with how we are, so that we don't over push, over stretch, losing that sensitivity through. Oh, I need to get to location B, and it doesn't matter what A is like. <laughs> I'm just going for B. We forget about this. Actually, through becoming familiar to this body, heart, mind moment, it's how we. Develop the sensitivity, the presence, the steadiness, and we're going to need our creativity on this journey, yeah, as well. So we can offer you suggestions and ideas and you know practices, but at certain times you're going to need your own intuition and trust yourself to follow that. Trust your sense of playfulness to investigate that. This interweaving of insights, of gathering into well-being, of these Brahma Viharas, you'll see that they're actually for all of life. Why would we say that? Because they are the fabric of experience. The world that appears is really conditioned by the condition of the heart-mind. Yeah. So this time of retreat is a time for resting into a better world, inner and outer, as we shape how we're doing interiorly, we shape how the world out there starts to appear for us. And the quality that's lying through the Brahma Viharas in particular is a sense of living our best life for all beings living our best life for all beings, exhibiting the values, the meaningfulnesses, yeah. what we wish to see grow more, doing it for all beings. The Brahma Viharas are limitless, they expand our range and that's good for us and of course it's good for others also. So there's lots more to say about all of this, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. And yeah, we'll let's have a quiet moment together in the hall. And then we'll take a little break. But I'll just have this quiet moment just to let settle what's been shared. Thank you for your listening and your presence. So we're going to have a meditation in about 10 minutes time. And it will be lightly guided by Zohar to kind of settling us into the retreat and into our practice. So I just want to say something about writing in the hall. So really feel invited to write when there's a a talk or an instruction, um, but at all other times we'll kind of let the hall be a place of silence and, and time for kind of gathering. So if you feel that there's things you want to write down, maybe, you know, in the walking periods or elsewhere, or, you know, some brilliant insight comes to you, even in the middle of a meditation, we kind of just resist the urge to stop and write that down. Or Also at the end of meditations, just leave the hall as a space that's kind of set up for people to be practicing quietly. I hope that's a support for everyone.
but yeah, if it's supportive for you to do some some writing at certain times, then do feel free to do that. And maybe being relatively quiet about it, relatively discreet about it, so it doesn't disturb others. And also just checking if it's actually what's helpful for you uh, at times as well. Okay, so let's have our ten minutes. Feel free to carry on practicing in the hall for longer if you like. And if you need a break, if you need to stretch your legs, you can either do that in here or head out for a bit. Right, thanks for your listening and your presence. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.